since it's a Mike Arnold show and he's always got the tie dye and the Grateful Dead stuff. This is the inaugural appearance of my t-shirt company's first shirt. All right, can you see this? Uh, yeah. Who who is who's Lemmy Hill? Mike. Oh oh oh, that's Benny Hill as a guitarist. Oh, that's good stuff. That's Benny Hill as Lemmy from Motorhead. Oh, okay. I know who Lemmy from Motorhead is. <laughs> it's yeah. not up for sale yet. The website's the website's going to be. I bought the domain. It's called Fat Manatees. Uh, dot I like com. it. I like it quite a bit. I tried to get manatees.com, but somebody wanted to sell it to me for like $35,000. I'm like, I'm going to lose money on these shirts. I, I, why would I want to do that? <laughs> yeah. I'm in this to have fun. I'm not I, got, to... I got a cool logo. I'll show you guys the logo one of these days. Mm-hmm. Logo's back here, but I'm not turning around right now. Yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Bobby Icino, co-host of the Futures Edge. If you watch our show, you can come and join us live. We have an event going on with Scott Shelley, the famous cow guy. You've seen him on TV with his cow jacket on Fox, on financial networks, as well as his own show on RFD TV, which is kind of a fun network. And the panel consists of myself, Jim Iorio, uh, Michael Lee, and Kenny Polcari. We all know Kenny Polcari very well. Great friend of mine in Jimmy's. And Michael Lee is uh, one of the best sort of down to the bone stock analysts that you're ever going to meet. Uh, this is called The Cow Guy Invites You to Greener Pastures with the Common Sensocrats. So there will be policy. There will be uh, politics as it applies to policy, as it applies to markets. So this thing is going to set you up for the next 12 months of investing. We've got a presentation, we've got drinks, we've got fraternization time, and we've got dinner. So check out the link, come to the show. You're gonna enjoy it, Nashville, June 13th. We're gonna have a blast. It's gonna be at the Grand Hyatt Nashville, great venue. We hope to see you all there. All right, welcome to Futures Edge. I'm Jim Muriel, that's Bob Iacchino. You probably figured that out before. Most of the people who are watching the show have watched it many, many times. And it's first Friday of every month, which by the way, I always view this show as more for me than for anyone else. Like Mike Arnold steers my medium and even some of my long-term trades based on some of the charts we do. And uh, it's Mike Arnold, who is the chief technician of Path Trading Partners. Michael, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Did you have any desire? Well, I know you have desire to. Do you have any desire to spend the money to go see the dead at the Sphere? Yes. So will you, how much can you, what, what can you do that for? Oh, you can do it. It's, it's pretty reasonable. They have so many shows. You can get in for a whole bunch of different prices, anywhere from a hundred to 300 bucks. Oh my gosh. I would have guessed a thousand. It's not mm-hmm. insane. It's not insane. My, my challenge is setting aside the time to, to um, make the five hour drive. How many members of the dead are not in fact dead currently? Um, just Jerry's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you go through the, uh, no, you have all the, all, all the keyboardists are dead. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Honestly, but I mean, who's, like is Phil Lesh dead. playing with them? No, Phil Lesh is not playing with them. Is okay. he dead? No, Phil is quite alive still. And, and touring with. Almost, honestly, man, some of the members of the dead and people like Keith Richards, they are not really advancing the idea that drugs are bad for you. <laughs> at all uh, I, I don't know what, what drug use Bobby Weir did in his, his, his prior days but now when he's touring with the Dead and Company his I mean he, he's getting up there in age and he posts some of his workout routines he's as a personal trainer following him and he he is in amazing shape for his age so it's, it's the balance well, last question the stress and the stress that drugs eliminates and uh, your lifespan, I think, something like that. It could easily be. But last question, how long are they going to be playing at the Sphere? Is it just an un, unannounced end date? It's, no, they not. They just extended uh, two more weeks. I think the last shows are right around middle August. I think around August 13th. They just added two more weekends. So, And then I don't know beyond that. Well, but 
you know, got it, got it, got it. I mean, it's a nice residency for them there. To, so we'll see. Good. Okay, let's let's talk about markets real quick, and I know we're going to get to technicals, obviously. Um, something I think has happened in the last even days that I think the the it's a tipping point on the economy, particularly the number one thing on the list that Atlanta Fed GDP now tracker going from four point two to one point eight in three weeks' time. To me, I thought was rather alarming. Now you throw that in with the fact that. The last GDP number was 1.3, much lower than expected. The ISM number was shit that we saw. I believed things were shit before they were even telling us they were. Bobby, do you think we are at an economic tipping point? I do. Here's There's two things that give me pause. Number one is Mike Singleton doesn't. Um, so that gives me pause. And we're going to be talking to him on our other show, uh, The Trader's Edge, tomorrow. Um, you guys won't be seeing this, so I'm not actually plugging the show because this is pre-recorded. But uh, we'll be talking to him about it. But something that struck me was not just the ISM manufacturing PMI, but one of the components in the ISM manufacturing PMI, which was new manufacturing orders, uh, it was 45 and change, dropping from 47. So for those of you who know, the ISM 50, above 50 expansion, below 50s contraction. And manufacturing PMI itself, not the number I've referenced, but the manufacturing PMI, while we're not a very large manufacturing economy, it correlates to stock performance extremely well, extremely well. So such that when manufacturing PMI is rising, usually equities are rising. So I worry about that because the new orders dropped well into contraction and they were weaker than expected and weaker than last month. So I think we're at one. But you guys will have already hopefully watched what Mike Singleton thinks. So it is funny because there are certain things like when I come across disagreeing with Mike Singleton, disagreeing with Jim Bianco or disagreeing with Cameron, it's always very like I have to because and you don't you, we want to be individualists. We want to yeah. chart our own course. But those guys always you said, give me pause, which is the fancy way of me saying I better recheck my work. So I exactly. do, so, I do think we're at a tipping point. So yeah, I'm nervous about it. That, and I do the, think, by the way, that's a good thing, Jimmy, about these episodes because Mike isn't going to say, "I think this is happening." He's going no. to say, "This is what's happening." Yep. And that's so, it. And the, this is what may happen if we go through here. I, right. I love and, that. And then me too. And there, there are some things like you guys. I, of course, we're going to do stocks first. But if you saw there, just there was a beat down in the metals uh, arena today. Not sure why I personally think just it was just a function of market positioning, but I'm curious as what Mike has to say about that. So let's start with stocks. How about that? Yep. So, you know, what's interesting is uh, for, you've heard me long term. I mean, we're still I don't have buy signals long term because they're based off valuation metrics and valuation metrics are nowhere near where they're going to need to be to issue a, a long term. And that's a multi year buy. But short, medium term, it's been in it's been in bullish mode. So in terms of medium and especially shorter term, it's getting to where we're really getting waning momentum. That does not mean we magically have to plummet, but the spidey sense and a lot of things are up that I'm a, from a short-term perspective, I, I, as I've said on my own, own the, the path trading stream every day, I'm, I'm rotating more and more into short-term bills because I'm not looking to eke out uh, another little small percentage versus what I can secure in, in bills at this point because of what everything's tip, everything's potentially tipping over now. Do we have any major sell signals yet? No. We've started to do some minor technical damage in the short term. So I am looking personally for downside potential front run patterns for a what will either be turning into a more of a pullback market or a stagnant choppy market. Now, it might never happen because I need to wait for signals to trigger. But things are getting more and more iffy from a technical standpoint moving forward. Here's my question. So when I look at that, you know, it looked like kind of a classic downward uh, pennant 
that we potentially could break up, break be breaking out of to the upside, particularly if you had some more strength tomorrow. Is there a level on the upside where you think that was a consolidation pennant and we're going to run this thing to the upside? What level would that be if it's the case? I mean, if we run this, I, I would not be surprised even to run it up and retest this high area from April, beginning of April, and then again from the third week in May. But does that mean we're really going to keep plowing higher? Not necessarily. Now, from a bigger standpoint, a bigger, if we zoom out here, if we zoom out, let me take off some of these lines. You, we have a really nice, on a weekly basis, potential double top. Uh, another little rotation up there will not change this from a big potential double top because we don't have enough separation uh, between these two points on a weekly basis, between the highs from May, and the week of Monday to May 20th to even this week. And even if we break higher, Unless we can pl power through about four, uh, 5,500, the double remains in place. So we could still that's we could still edge up more, and it does not it does not change anything in the short term. What starts getting interesting, though, where well, you can see on the weekly basis, the last bigger correction we pulled back to the bottom of the weekly rotation zone. And now we're trying to hold the top of the weekly rotation zone. But if we start rotating down and potentially retest the lows from mid-April, it's going to get real interesting, potentially really quick for the markets. So that's why I'm personally not looking to eke out a 1% or 2% more considering the risk because everything from my perspective is risk reward and the rewards are not substantially outpacing the risk that has been taken at this point. That's not to say they're, no, they're still short-term trades because, again, you could be in something and out of something two days later. But from a more of a really wanting to hold things even going into the medium term, it's, it's getting skewed to whether it could go Flat to choppy with you're not getting a return on your money necessarily to a downside risk where you're losing your money. That's why I'd rather be in some short term instruments and lock in a decent rate of return. So if I if I could summarize sort of what you said right there and you could correct me if I'm wrong. If someone were to say to you, are you bullish? You'd say yes. Are you putting on new positions? Not here, because theoretically the upside return you may get versus the amount of downside that could happen just isn't balanced enough for you to put on new positions. Correct. It, I mean, especially with the short-term yield still, I mean, the, the tenure has dropped a little over the last bit, but the, the short-term yields are still, you know, lock in five and a quarter percent and with, with what, no risk? If, unless the government disappears, which is, and that's not happening in the next couple of months. So I'd rather lock in a, a, a return of slightly better than 5% with no downside risk and trying to lock in a little more upside with with something that could turn on a dime. Now, you know, I'm not talking nimble positions like you get in something on a Monday, you get out of it on a Tuesday. I'm talking something I could want to get into it in June and maybe not get out of it till the end of the year, not looking for those right now. I have a, um, I tweeted out, I should say I quote tweeted or reposted, whatever you want to say, um, a picture from whole Mars catalog, which is a very large uh, account on X over 400,000 followers. And they posted a picture of uh, NVIDIA CEO, Jensen Huang signing a woman's breast. She's got her shirt up. And he's signing it and they put on there, uh, the CEO of NVIDIA is signing boobs like a rock star. Is this a top signal? And I, I just thought that was not only probably correct, but also a great thing to kind of look for where people are like worshiping CEOs like a rock star. So many things to remind you of the 2000s. That, I saw that today and that was like the magazine yeah, yeah. cover. You know, it's like, okay. And, and I've been talking for a last couple of weeks, you know, we're down to the magnificent one. <laughs> I mean, what is, yes, but I thought when the others rolled over that the, that we would, the stock market rolled over and that didn't happen. So I am kind of confused by that. 
Well, you know, there was a, again, this is going back to where we're going to talk to Mike Singleton tomorrow. And again, you guys are watching this. It's, it's over already. You missed it, but he, he talked about something in his note this morning and I can't remember who it is, but there was a hedge fund manager who put out a thesis that said that AI is all AI stocks are almost over. And here was the thesis. Hear me out. Large language models are making it so easy to write software. And part of the reason that software is so expensive is because software developers are expensive. But AI is progressing at such a rate and it's writing software uh, so cleanly and so quickly that the price of developing software is going to come down dramatically, decreasing the value of some, if not most, tech stocks. Now, obviously, I wouldn't apply to something like NVIDIA, but if your company, you know, develops software, I mean, who would that be? I guess you could say it's a uh, like a Cisco Systems or somebody like that. If you're, you're a company that SAS, you're a company that develops software and doesn't make chips, your profits are about to plummet because of AI. Is that like Oracle and Salesforce? Or- yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the cost to develop software is going to, according to this guy, is going to go down to effectively zero with large language models. Wow. That's yeah. wild. Which is funny because I, I, you know, if this is a big technological revolution, which many say it is, I'm still not hundred percent convinced, although I think it probably is, but you start to, you get, you can't, it's hard to figure out where, where it fills in and what happens. And I think that that's really fascinating because I love that theory. We'll see how that works. I yeah. do really good Sunday fun day images with AI. So it's helping me there for flyers. That- that's, that's, that's very, that's very good, Bob. <laughs> All right. That's the takeaway. Uh, my use. Yeah. Okay. What now? Uh, let's do the NASDAQ. And I, I asked Mike to, to prep some multi time frame analysis for the good. NASDAQ as I kind of want to show people how he does this. I think this is super interesting. So if you don't mind, Jimmy, Mike, just take it away. I want to. Well, I always, First of all, multi time frame analysis, no matter what time frame you're trading, it is always helpful because it keeps the bigger picture in mind. And I'll, leave, I'll go out to, for longer term stuff, uh, the, the monthly charts. And I'll, I don't need to look at them every day, but once a month, you start there and it just keeps the bigger, the real big picture in mind of what would start doing technical damage to this market on a monthly basis. And then I go down to the weekly and the daily. For futures, I'll go down to shorter term beyond the daily. For stocks, I generally do monthly, weekly, daily. So, but but if you look at here on the monthly chart, we're, we've been riding, we came off the October lows. We've been riding the rotation zone up. And if we even look here, a pullback, on the NASDAQ, even 16.3 is just returns that you, a lot of people would be uh, freaking out. And in the short term, you might be freaking out. But on a longer term basis, it just pulls us back to the prior breakout area. The prior window that I'd be looking at on a monthly basis would be the 16.3 to about uh, 15.9. You start dropping below 15.9 we'd be going below the monthly rotation zones. Now, these will shift up a bit if this bull market continues. And even if, it's, if it flattens out, these numbers will come up a little. But 15.9, if you just look at it, that was a prior top in um, July, of uh, July, August of 23. Then we came back to the October lows. So anywhere in this from the prior highs in January 22 to the highs in August 23 is a major support zone. So that keeps my first perspective. Then if I drop down to the weekly chart, first technical damage was somewhat done when we went to neutral mode. We went to neutral mode uh, middle of April when we closed below the rotation zone, but we've climbed back up into bullish mode. So. What am I seeing now on the weekly basis? What could possibly bring us back down to that 15.8? Well, we have a potential double top. So, which may never trigger. If I take off some of the lines in here and just sort of clean up the chart a bit, you can see 
they don't have to line up exactly. They're still within a range of uh, what, what can work unless we start substantially driving above 19,100. If we start going above 19,100, at least in the NASDAQ, the double top is out of play. But what do I have to be concerned about? Well, I have to be concerned about this low from April 15th, which is around the 17,100 area. We close below that, we've triggered a double top, which takes us back to that breakout area. So that's potentially to that breakout area. So that's my next thing. Then I also know that this key area, right? Michael, what's the level on the breakout area, Michael? The level on the breakout, let me jump, jump back to the monthly. You can see it real easily. The breakout area is anywhere from about 16, uh, 300 to right around 15, eight, 15, nine. Right in there. Yeah. So, you know, that would be, the, but that would be the first warning sign on the weekly basis trigger that, hey, we're going to start that possible monthly, um, multi month pullback to that breakout area. We start breaking below that 15.8. Then we start getting into, okay, now there's major monthly technical damage being done, which then we're probably lower for longer. So if I go back to the weekly, this is how I break everything down so I have a game plan in my mind. Now, between roughly about 18,600 to 18,450 is a key support zone. We start breaking below 18,450. I'm watching the lows from the end of May. The end of May, if I switch back to the daily, the end of May, you see we had the nice little month end window dressing that we spiked down to the 50 EMA on the daily. So that is going to be a very critical level now on my daily time frame. Why we start breaking down below that, even if we start closing below about 18.6, I'll start sitting up and take notice because we could easily start retesting that level. And then if we break below those low, lows, which are 18,241, then I'm gonna start watching for the bigger pullback on the daily level. And that would take us further into the weekly rotation zone. And then I'd start looking for key levels. Now, can, I can go down, let's say I'm swing trading or even day trading futures. I can go down sub to there with so far, we have a uptrend, so I have to still be trading on the shorter term basis. I have to be giving favor to the uptrend unless we start breaking below that 50. Then I have to get to more a neutral balanced way. And if some of these other significant patterns trigger, then I have to start shifting more and favoring the short side on a daily basis. But that's how I look at stuff. Now, one other thing, if we start breaking below that 50 EMA and the lows from Friday the 31st, when I talked earlier about front run patterns, my level was about 17,830 on a closing basis. Why, if we close below there, we shift the probabilities in the short term to we should, from a probability standpoint, retest about 17,400 to about 17,350 and if those levels do not hold, we could trigger that double top pattern, which would then start cascading us much lower. So that's everything to the downside, how right now the upside sort of taking care of itself. And all I do is use the harmonic projections to find out key areas. Should we keep trending up? Then it's just constantly raising a trailing stop and identifying what are the next levels where I am going to take action, either take off profits in the short term or at least raise a stop from a short term trade. So based on the negative three, positive three, this seems like a one and a half upside that could that could break down depending on those characteristics you put out, right? Yes, maybe a one to the upside. We're really getting some waning momentum here. Yeah. We are, we're starting to get more and more divergences between the short-term RSI. Even with this push higher, we're significantly below 
the last couple pushes we've been able to sustain. So the market, now this does not mean the market has to crash or collapse or anything else. The market could go into consolidation. It could sit and pull back, not even trigger this massive double top. Those lows from April could hold and we could chop around. But then that's why I'm also saying, hey, maybe from my perspective, if we go into a chop around mode, I still want to return on my money rather than tying it up in the short term. And so that's why I mentioned the T-bill thing, because that's what I'm looking at for. With waning momentum, the upsides, it's getting harder and harder to, to push the boulder up that hill. So we all know a lot of people that think every major dip in the stock market should be bought. Is using multi time frame, especially going from a lower time frame to a higher, in other words, from daily to weekly and weekly to monthly, could those longer term charts help people pick when they could be buying dips if they wanted to put buys below the market? You know, is it is it safer, for example, to put it, you know, somewhere in the rotation zone on the monthly or at a target of a double on a weekly or something like that. Is that something people could use this for, number one? And number two, if people start getting tattoos of Jensen Wang's face on their asses, that's a sell, right? It's definitely a sell. Yeah, it's it, it's sell in May and go away for a very long time. <laughs> I mean, I see like the monthly as something where there's people that just, they're like, when do you buy this dip? My recommendation would always be, well, let me look at the monthly, you know, because usually at a daily chart where people are saying that. Right. And that's why I like to keep the bigger perspective in mind, because I mentioned that even that 16.3, 16.4 level takes a smack dab. That would be the 50% retracement from the lows last October to what's gone from the recent highs in May. And these numbers will shift. Should we go on this meet, we can make slightly new highs. These numbers will slightly shift. But it, from the longer term perspective, I, I should say more from the midterm perspective, because unless valuations really start getting back to where they need to be, I won't have a long term buy signal, but we could get midterm bounce signals. You see that 50% retracement is run that 16.5. And as I've talked about many times, I watch for reversal signals, which in this case, if it dropped between 16.5 and about 15, 970, 16,000, that would be an area I'd watch for a bounce at least. So that could be a medium term buy. I also, look, something could happen and trigger a massive pullback. Therefore, if we break below those other levels, I, the levels I said before, that's 15,800, which would also potentially close us below that 62 and a half. Any buys I put on in here from a broad market standpoint, not individual stocks or anything, I'd have to very rapidly reevaluate because we could be heading for a more substantial pullback. But that's the first level from a monthly basis. I'd at least be looking for a a bounce pattern can we move to metals we triggered a uh, this is a weekly uh, this is daily chart sorry back on the 23rd of may we triggered in copper a double top but it had a little bounce to a key area by the way when one of the little things i watch for is those bounces between the lows and the candle bodies after it's been triggered so the low was 481. The candle bodies were about 487. We triggered it, bounced up there, and then kissed it goodbye. And the final target area we finally hit today, I was I refined the targets because the 50 EMA, we just hit it today. So essentially the pattern's completed from my perspective. Does that mean it, the downside has to be over? No, but this is the first area I will start watching for another potential little bounce on a daily perspective, but we're starting to get technical damage done in copper. Whereas if the, if the lows, let me get back to the weekly, if the lows do not hold right around this 450 mark, we could then be returning in short order to about 435 if they if it cannot hold here. So that's pattern that triggered 
and has come to completion in copper. In silver, we might yeah. trigger a double top pattern. We confirmed it, but we have not triggered it yet. It looks like it's triggered today. So we could keep seeing a bigger pullback in silver. And any bounces in silver, I'd be looking for rollover plays in that. So would I be chasing silver at this point? No, we could easily return deeper into the weekly rotation zone. And then gold. Tell me this. Can you do me a favor? Can you walk me through the double top pattern? Oh, is this, is this it right here? You, the double top trigger? pattern's right here. This is on silver. So you see how it's going to be triggered by close bow here. And if I do jump back to copper, it was lopsided, but it still did not invalidate the rules. So this, the right-hand side can go slightly higher. And then we triggered it and came down. We came down below the daily rotation zone all the way to that 50 EMA and the prior consolidation before the last little run-up. So these patterns are very, very powerful, especially copper made a double top with a waning momentum divergence. So that's at least, it doesn't mean, and I said this, don't, I wouldn't be going in and rushing out to short it, but I'd be looking to take profits on longs and be very patient on pullback patterns. Gold, which you can see right here, this is one side, I can show it on the weekly. Here's your weekly. And you'll be able to spot it perfectly right here. Look at this nice double top. May never trigger. May never trigger, but I'm still bullish long-term in gold. However, we start closing below 22.85. I will look for the bigger pullback. This would not, this is not something I'd rush out because of the long-term bias. It's trading against a lot of the longer term rotation zones, especially on the monthly basis. But could this return it to a weekly or a monthly rotation zone back around 2220? Yeah, easily. So that's where I'll sit up and take notice and say, hey, it could even return it back to the 50 week to around 2150. So again, not a short for me, but a patience on, okay, I got to be prepared for the bigger pullback then. Remember, nothing goes up in a straight line. We have to, unless you have the Fed juicing the markets, uh, nothing goes up in a straight line. We have to be able to be prepared for these, these longer term or these medium term pullbacks within a longer term bull market. Love it. That makes sense. So I did put some silver puts on uh, a couple about a week, two weeks ago that I'm glad I have on. So it's not a hundred percent exposed. I didn't tell anybody. If you guys don't want to believe me, that's fine. I'm talking. I know Bobby and Mike do. I'm talking yeah. to the people watching, <laughs> but uh, I might put more on if it uh, if it did triple. Tri tri uh, it did uh, trigger that double top. So maybe I will. Just for support standpoint, I'd really watch about this. 28 uh 7, 2850 to 2895 area for potential key support in silver at least in the short term. Bobby as far as a trading vehicle for for silver by the way I'm not according to my lawyers you know this is for them I'm not recommending any ETFs but do you think SLV or PSLV is a better vehicle or does it matter? I think SLV is better. Okay. Just on liquidity. I, Just because of honest, liquidity. Yeah, I have not looked at the structure by the one. But the Sprott, the supposedly the Sprott. I like Sprott better. Exactly. I like PSLV. I know Mike, like, I know Mike likes Sprott, but I, I haven't looked at the breakdown of either one. When we were trading our, our fun signals together, uh, we always did Sprott. But I, I just go SLV for what we do here, simply because it's more commonly known. Well, and and that means there's liquidity in it too. So there's just... There's something positive about each one, something negative. For trading like swing trading where you don't really care, it's, you can trade SLV. If you're looking for longer term holds or trading around a core long term position, uh, I really prefer the Sprott for both gold and silver. I, I want to look at crude oil and I have a specific Damn right reason. I do, yeah. I have a specific reason for this. And Mike, you may not have it on your chart, um, but I've been talking about it a lot. If you go to um, basically, let's say April 5th, we've been in sort of a best fit down channel. 
And the reason I say best fit is I sort of drew the the initiating point, the defining point in the first like five or six days of the move, right? I had a downtrend line and then I realized that we had sort of a parallel channel going. Um, and again, it's really best fit. But I thought it was interesting that we tried to break out to the upside basically seven days ago and failed. And not only did we fail, but we basically broke out to the downside. Again, it's not a perfect channel. There's no trading signal here. I've never been a fan of selling breakouts of a down channel because you put a stop somewhere above the middle of the channel you know, and you're just kind of like, you can go back up into the channel and you're still in a bearish pattern and you're getting stopped out. So um, what what do you think of this channel, if anything? Like, uh, I've been following that same channel. I just took it off for one of the live streams, but I've been pretty much following the same channel down. Now we did, we did some substantial technical damage in the short term in crude. Breaking below a very strong support base, which was formed in February, retested in March, retested multiple times in May, we bounced up. This was like a double shake and bake pattern. Uh, it it got people to the short side. You might have to explain. You might have to explain that. The shake and bake is is a term I use when people watch it. it especially horizontal uh, consolidation patterns. And it breaks one way from that. It sucks people in and then it snapshots the other way. And all those people have to cover or admit they're wrong and they change their position and it gives momentum to the other side. Now this on a closing basis started doing technical damage back on the 23rd of May started acting like it was breaking down, snapped up to the other side over a couple day period. And I was even like, hey, I'm looking for longs now. It did not hold key support and just went the other way completely. Where were we down five days? We closed yesterday below the 62 and a half. We closed yesterday below major, major support. So any rallies now, in the short term, I'm looking for rollover plays. I'm watching, and this will be critical. By the time this comes out, we'll know. But that 200 week, which has held for a very, very, very long time, unless we get a massive snapback rally this week, it'll be the first close below the 200 week. Wow. The last time we closed below it from an uptrend, was before we went to negative 40 bucks a barrel. So I'm not saying we're going back to 40. I was going to ask you if you thought we could make new lows from negative 40 bucks. No, no. But what what would that put me into watching for and possibly the return to the mid to upper 60s for a key support price point? And then in order for me to get bullish, I need to see a decent bombing pattern down there. It would not, it would take me out of anything bullish in the near term besides looking for rollover so, plays. So closing under that 200 week, you think is relatively key, correct? Oh yeah, that's relatively key. And I mean, we, we might, by the time we, this comes out, we'll know, but I'm going to be watching for a bounce pattern to come up in the next couple of days. But unless it can start getting closes above 7650, I'm I'm looking for rollovers. Uh, no, it's terrible. Honestly. The I, I can't stand the US. So it's funny because crude oil doesn't always affect the price of oil company stocks, but it has started to. So I might say that, you know, for right now, because they lag, oil company stocks lag in both directions. When crude oil spikes, oil company stocks don't jump right away. And when, um, like, for example, ExxonMobil today had a bad chart, Valero had a bad chart, Mike Phelan put either one of those up. But I would say that the best option, because of where we are in the sell-off, if it were to continue, would be oil company stocks. And I never say that. If you can't trade futures, if you can trade futures, you want the futures. 
by the way, on my Exxon mic, am I, was I given an opportunity today? The fact that it bounced back up and created that wick, is that the kiss that you're supposed to buy some puts now? Uh, I'm going to be watching for possibly crude. We might get a buy set up for tomorrow. We might, but these would be things I'd be looking for rollover plays. Not interested in Exxon unless it can start trading above about 117 again. Uh, we got a 200 EMA magnet price. This is just a reaction to that crude today. I'm expecting this to come back. And I was bullish for a long time on Exxon. But now this 50% harmonic and the 200 area, at least to 109.50 to 110 is where I'll be watching for something more substantial bottom because then there's a fantastic stop level. If it starts closing below 106, I don't want to, I don't want to be touching Exxon in the uh, short to medium term at all. So take a look at Valero when you're done talking, but go ahead. I mean, if I did get some buy set up around the 200, it would be only a swing trade, a swing trade with potential. But if crude doesn't start reacting well, then if if it lost those key levels and started closing below 106, I'd be now nah, time to be very, very patient on stuff uh, in the oil space. Bobby, while he's switching over to Valero, the fundamental thesis of this, is this reflecting what we talked about at the beginning of the show, what I believe, what you maybe believe, but Mike Singleton doesn't, that we are at a, a demand inflection point? Do you think that's what it's showing us? or is there that, more is, that is what it means to me. Because one of the things that people forget is manufacturing PMI. Uh, manufacturing companies use a lot of energy like across the spectrum, not just gasoline, not just crude oil, not just jet fuel. You know, it's not just cars and planes and heating oil, right? It, they use a lot and, you know, they use a lot of, of energy just as a general statement. The second thing I'd say to that is this is the first time that we've seen a light at the end of the tunnel for more production from OPEC. Now, if you look at the OPEC announcement, they said they're extending the current production cuts the theoretically mandatory ones and the voluntary ones. And then starting in uh, November of 2024, they're going to start to slowly ease the voluntary production cuts, meaning that countries who want to produce more, all of them can produce more. And Iraq continues to violate even the mandatory cuts. They continue to produce more. So if you've got slowing data with that, that's what will get. And I think I mentioned this before. I'm not sure I might have written about it. I'm not sure if I wrote about it or mentioned it. But hedge funds were getting long. And institutionals, which hedge, okay, they don't speculate. Speculative hedge funds were getting long. And the institutions were hedging their their. Uh, spot exposure, their cargo exposure. So that was pointing to sort of a sell-off of sort of long liquidation if something happened. And we saw that last week when you look at the volume on crude oil last week, it was pretty significant. Mikey with his Valero chart. Valero, that that's not a good looking chart. It, even if we get a bounce over the next yeah. few days, I'll be watching for a rollover. We have, here's, look, look at, the, where it broke out, it broke out from a triple top back in in March of this year. And at this point, I would not be surprised from the run-ups back in last May of 23 to the highs in April of 24, would not be shocked to see this retest, this 145 level, 50-week EMA, and the triple top breakout area. So that would be the first area I'd be watching for a potential short-term buy pattern because it could be kept with a really, really tight stop in that area. I would not be looking for anything. We might get a bounce over the next couple of days, but then I'd be watching for a rollover play. And if you look at that, the uh, daily, just, just below that area, just below that 145 is the 200, the 200 simple. So... And which is, it gives me an area to look at. So that would be the only thing I'd be watching. And if, if Valero goes below well, about 135 on a closing basis, uh, we could, 
it could be in a world of hurt to possibly go back to the 200 week moving average area. Bobby, does Valero pay you a dividend or no? Is there any buffer there? Yeah. Does yeah. the same as like the other ones uh, above 3%, you know, or you didn't it's buy right, for that. I know. Right. Right in that same range. Let me see. I can pull it up really quick. Mike can too, but I'll be, yeah. Okay. 2.78. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that it matters in a, like you said, in a 5.2, three month note, but I don't know. Right. I just like to keep an eye on those things. Right. Yeah. Um, Where right, do you want to hit? Can you do yeah. uranium? We can do uranium. Uh, you tell me. I have a, one of the stocks on that Tracy Shukart uh, recommended if I wanted exposure to uranium. Well, here I follow URA for okay. I mean, this is one been you know, trade tradable around a core position for uranium. Uh, you yeah. can see here on the monthly chart. We have so we we broke back in twenty one. We set up this key, very key topping area, retested in 22, had to form a multi-month base through last June. Ran back up into this key resistance area and formed a base right there. Poked up a couple times, but formed a pretty solid base and is now trying to rotate up. And in the scheme of things, here's your bigger picture uranium chart since 2011. So there is still plenty of room to run to the upside uh, longer term. And I really look at uranium on a longer term. Even on a pullback in to about on URA, to even if it managed all the way back to 27, that's where, from a longer term perspective, I'll be looking for key buy opportunities, not sell opportunities. Okay, so you guys who are listening, I mean, I know you're not dumbasses. You know exactly why I bought it. And the thesis is that we moved away from nuclear power thinking we were smart and we could reinvent the wheel. And all of a sudden we had the oh shit moment in Europe. And that's, you know, potentially spread around the world. 34 different countries signed a pact to try to increase nuclear power, including the uh, United States, France, Germany, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Bobby, you like the fundamental thesis, right? I do. Yeah. And you have the AI component in there. You Those NVIDIA chips are hungry for power. A AI and electrification of, of, the, uh, of everything, like these things are all kind of coming together that could push uh, uranium significantly higher, I thought. That's why I'm in already. I'm, uh, I got in at a, got a bad spot, but I have levels set that I'm going to buy as it goes up. And this is also, and I've talked about this, this is definitely, like I mentioned, sprot silver and gold for trading around a core position. Uranium is, from my viewpoint, is trading around a core position. So you have a long-term bullish bias, and then you can add and subtract to that long-term position. You know, you can take trade those shorter-term topping patterns and maybe lock something in, waiting for them to pull back to key levels and re-add to that core long-term position. And so you can sort of harvest some uh some yield some price yield while waiting for this to really get a move on because at some point uranium could could start on us a, a more a faster terror to the upside right bobby what do you want to look at next or last let's last i'd say right let's do the dollar absolutely oh you want to talk about the good old dollar the dollar index is at a incredibly critical juncture. Incredibly. This is the weekly chart. So you have the short term, and we had the sell-off going into December, January 24. We had set up an intermediate high in December 23. We retest that high in February 24. We broke above it came up to a very critical 87.5 harmonic and then uh, continued the pullback to that prior breakout area. You can see it right here. Let me clean up the chart just a bit. So here, you see the highs from December 23, retested February 24, 
broke above it, retested on the pullback. So that's prior resistance becoming support, ran up, and now we're back to that critical support area. And the uh, pretty much the flat 50, but it's more important this critical support level. We, if we start breaking below here, just from a price action, we could return to 102 potentially. Now, the only thing that gets me bullish has to do some heavy lifting right now because we do have a little potential double, but that may never trigger. We need a close above 104.7, we'll just call it 104.80 on a daily basis before I get into back into dollar bull mode at all. So that's sort of where it sits now from a longer term harmonic position. The support level, it should be break down below about this 103.70 area. My first next target area is 103.20. And the kiss it goodbye level is about 102.50. We close below 102.50 on a weekly basis. I'll be then watching for the retest of the lows from January of 24. Sorry, yes, January of 24. If we can, I wanted to ask one more thing real quick because this is sort of a pat on the back moment. I think it was the last show, but it might have been the one before that. You pointed out a developing double top in Diamond Bag Energy. And I just wanted to point that out. I think it was two shows ago where I asked you to look at it and you pointed out a potential double top. What's the symbol for that? Fang, the pattern. Fang, remember? Fang. I didn't know Fang. why it was called Fang until I realized it was a <laughs> snake and it was a fantastic moment for me. It, it, yeah, so. It that turned into a channeling double. It's, like it's it's very evident of how they sort of, you know, things don't go immediately to target. And there's a lesson in there that as long as you stick with the plan put in place when the pattern initiated, right? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you wouldn't have been able to get in this one right away. You would have had to waited for that rotation back up. Am I right? You could easily could have got in it uh, on the week of our even May 2nd you would have had to stick with a little heat, but it never triggered. I was just looking because this is not one that I watch all the time, but I was in order to invalidate the pattern before it hit the first target, which it hit in the 22nd on the 22nd of May, you would have had to close on the daily basis above one Oh, above two Oh six 74, which it, you took a little heat, but it never closed above that level. It never even traded through that level. Show them the trigger in the entry. The official trigger would have been on Wednesday, May 1st, on that close. That does not mean you have to enter that because you have to still look at reward to risk. Any time after that, whether it was the second when it bounced back up to the breakdown point or any day after that that did not invalidate the pattern, you pretty much had one, two, three, like, uh, you pretty much had about a, a week just over a week to get in this before it it really ran down. Yeah, it just it shows like when you're when you're trading on the sh especially on patterns like this and especially on the short side because everybody's in stocks because everybody likes to buy the dip in stocks, right? That's oh, it went lower, it's a good company, I'm going to buy it. You have a pattern like this and it's high probability and you actually say, "Well, I don't worry about the heat because I've got my stop and I've got my target and that's that. It may take a while and you may take some heat, but if you've researched your pattern, your process, you just stay in it. And, you know, I'm not saying it's going to work every single time, but it still ends up being the right thing to do. Probabilities, baby. And if you look in terms of the weekly chart, what do we just do? We pull back straight to the bottom of the weekly rotation zone. So we might get a bounce right, here, yeah. but, you know... Yeah. If this starts breaking down because of energy, then the next key area, the next key area could be a return to the multi-month breakout area around this 175. Just keep that in mind. That doesn't mean there won't be short-term plays, but to get married to a position has to uh, really form a strong base. Cool. Just like in real life, to get to get married, you need a strong base. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
Okay. I failed so, to mention earlier, Jim, that all the proceeds for my t-shirt company, once I launch it, will be going to the restoration and modification of a 1970 Corvette. So fantastic. Very, I, I haven't, I haven't bought charity. it yet, but I haven't <laughs> bought it yet, but it will be, that's, that's the charity it's going to. That's fantastic. So I want you guys to notice something who are, who are watching the show. If we were on the TMZ of financial networks, they would have had called us all and said, hey, can you talk about Roaring Kitty and meme stocks? Because they're all, it's all full of shit nonsense. You could go go trade all those meme stocks you want, but that's a casino. We're trying to, we're, real traders don't, great, you all have at it. That's not what we're looking at. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we started our own thing. Bobby and I were cast offs from mainstream financial networks um, because of that, because they t- try to, push you to a position on whatever the trade du jour is, whatever they think they can sell to the masses. And it's mostly bullshit. But none of the stuff we do here is any... Oh, by the way, did you put up another chart? I thought we were going to go home now. That, that's, that's, that's GameStop, baby. Oh, GameStop. You were playing that's into GameStop. my... Too. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I don't want any part of that. Do you guys? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, that's the Vegas. Okay. okay. That, that's Vegas. If yeah, you want to set cool. aside like... Vegas, go Vegas. No, but if you want to, I tell people, you know what? If you want to, if you want to do something stupid and, and take like a very tiny percent, it's like going into you walk in the casino and saying, okay, on my trip, I'm allocating this very small percentage to gambling. Fine, go play this stuff. Then, but you know what? Be prepared to lose it all because this is not trading. This is not investing. It's as you said, it is friggin' gambling. It's a crap shoot. This is like this. For any of you that understand craps, playing stocks, or I should say investing in stocks, active investing in stocks, is like playing the, the, the point in, and playing the odds at a craps table. Meme stocks is like the point is four and you put all your money on a hard four. That's what it is. For those of you that understand this. And based on what Bobby just said, we like gambling, but gambling's yeah. not... Gambling's not our jobs. Our jobs are to slant living. probability in our favor. Yeah. Yeah. And this, anyway, anyway, I gotta, I gotta get out and this chart's just a mess. So who'd want to trade it anyways? Exactly. It doesn't even make any sense. Right. So forget about it. Yeah. But anyway, thank you to you people who are joining us here. Our mission to create this network has would be nothing without you. We get a ton of DMs. We get a ton of retweets. We thank you guys for all of them. This has been the Futures Edge. I'm Jim Murio. That's Bob Aitino. That's Mike Arnold. Follow us on Twitter.